everyone! Welcome back to my channel. My name is Heather and today I am here with my winter book haul. So these are all of the books that I acquired over the festive season. My birthday falls in November and then of course Christmas in December means a lot of books end up coming my way. To start off, I went to see Marissa from Blatantly Bookish yesterday and we exchanged gifts and she gave me some lovely things, including Briefly A Delicious Life by Nell Stevens, which I have been so excited to read for a very long time and may have given her this idea as I frantically looked for it at every book sale that we went to. This is the story of when Georges Sand and Chopin lived at the Alhambra together but it's told from the perspective of Blanca, who is the ghost of a young nun who is now haunting the Alhambra. And she also starts to fall in love with Georges Sand. I really liked Nell Stevens' other books. I've been to visit the Alhambra. I can't wait to see what this is like. And then she also gave me The Winter Spirits ghostly tales for frosty nights and this is a wintry collection of short stories by a ton of wonderful mainly historical fiction authors most of whom i really adore some i don't know but i can't wait to get to this then in other birthday related gifts my wonderful friend amanda bought me jane austen's wardrobe by hillary davidson and this is exactly what it sounds like. Hilary Davidson is a historical fashionista, historical costumer, and she has investigated various period pieces to see the sorts of things that would have been in Austen's wardrobe or on her radar. And many of you probably saw this because it is on my January TBR. Then my cousin and her husband very kindly gave me Long Shadow by Olivia Atwater which is the third and I believe the last in Olivia Atwater's Regency fairy tale series which I just adored for the past year or so. So I'm sad for it to end but I'm really excited to see where this one goes. This is very Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell-esque in that it's in an alternate Regency period where the fae and fairies exist side by side with non-magical people and a variety of tales unfold. And then my parents bought me two books for my birthday. The first is Mrs. Porter Calling by A.J. Pierce. This is the third in the Emmy Lake series. It began with Dear Mrs. Bird. So I can't tell you too much about this, but it is about women and journalism and romance and friendship all set in London during World War II. And then they also got me The Weaver and the Witch Queen by Genevieve Gornacek, which I honestly don't know what it's about, but I loved The Witch's Heart, which was a Norse mythology retelling, and this also looks like it's medieval Norse-ish sort of fantasy tale and I am here for all of those things. We're going to be bouncing back and forth a great deal in between which were books and which were gifts to myself. This one at least I did buy for research. This is the second Melody book, which is an American Girl book. I am trying to work on a series which compares the older style of American Girl books with their newer style. And I found book one of Melody's story at a local book sale. So eventually I went to American Girl and bought book two so I could have the full story to do my comparison. The newer versions only come in two books rather than six. So Melody, as you can tell, is growing up in 1964 and is trying to bring together her love for music the civil rights movement and all of the ideas that she is now old enough to understand that her two older siblings are coming home and telling her about. Then, as you also will have seen, I read Miss Bunkle's book in December and loved and adored it and wanted to read more and also saw that these editions 
are getting harder and harder to find. So I went ahead and bought six or seven D.E. Stevenson novels in that edition so I'd have them for the future. Miss Bunkle Married, you've already seen. I am currently reading that this month. I also bought in that same series The Two Mrs. Abbots, and possibly The Four Graces is a follow-up to the Miss Bunkle series. And then just four other D.E. Stevenson novels, which are The Young Clementina, The Baker's Daughter, Listening Valley, and Celia's House. These are all stories that are light and fun, sometimes romantic, sometimes about finding yourself, sometimes a combination of the two, in, that take place in small villages in either England or Scotland in between World War I and World War II. Barnes & Noble also had their after Christmas sale and this book was an absolute steal. So I picked up The Square of Sevens by Laura Shepard Robinson. I loved her other two books. I especially loved the latest one. Blood and Sugar was pretty good. So I honestly don't even know how this one ties into those other two books. I think it would be 18th century mystery, social justice sort of thing. But don't quote me on that. I actually don't know. I want to go into it kind of blind. Then I also bought three other books from Blackwell's that I knew I was going to have trouble finding here in the US. The first is Not the Type by Camilla Thurlow. The subtitle is Finding Your Place in the Real World. And this is about Camilla Thurlow, there she is, who in everything she did didn't seem the type to do it. I, like most people, saw her on Love Island a few years ago, where she just did not fit the typical type of someone to be on Love Island. She actually read books. She was very quiet, very introverted. I honestly really liked her and thought we could be really good friends. So she didn't seem the type to go on Love Island, yet she finished second. She did find someone who seemed to be a really good fit for her. They could both discuss you know, philosophy and things that you don't see happening on Love Island very often. But then of course came the inevitable question, so what do you do for a living? And she was, or had just finished, being in the bomb disposal unit for the military, which she also did not seem the type to have done. So this is her writing about all of those very surprising life choices that she made and the lessons that she has drawn from that and the lessons that she thinks that we can take from it as well. Then I also picked up A Power Unbound by Freya Marsk, which is the last in this particular series of hers. I have been reading this series through all of this year and really, really loved it. And it takes place in an alternate Edwardian England and US, they do go to New York in book two, where magic exists and some people do know about it. There's a whole government department dedicated to looking after it, controlling things, but most ordinary people don't know that. And this one young man ends up being pushed into this government post for the magical department and he had no idea any of it existed. And so the kind of ambassador for the magical world, appointed to be his liaison to help him get used to things, has to help him learn about this world. And in the meantime, they fall for each other. And then thirdly, they have to go on this huge magical quest, adventure, race against time. They are fantastic. They are very sexually explicit. But if you don't mind that, they are wonderful. The second book followed one of those young men's sister and a young woman that she meets in the second part of this quest. So here we follow two other male characters that we also met in that second book and they're both romance and the end to this huge adventure journey that everyone has been going on. And I can't wait.
And then, yes, this book is going to come out in the U.S., but I just couldn't wait to get my hands on it. I had to pick up Judy Dench's Shakespeare, The Man Who Pays the Rent. I heard about this on Olive's channel as she's planning to do her own Shakespeare project. I too love Shakespeare. I had my own Shakespeare project in the first year or two of my channel. So I'm really excited to see what Judy Dench has to say about her relationship with Shakespeare. From first seeing her first couple of plays as a young child, studying him in school, and then of course all of the wonderful roles that she has played throughout her very long career. What, what's not to love? That all sounds amazing. And I'm trying to hold off until April to read it, but I may not be able to. Then we have some other bookish items that I bought or was given. The first came from a teacher care crate that exists in the US and they had a bookish themed one and I was able to purchase a couple of the items from that box, which included this tiny book light, which has three settings. There's a warm tone and a cool tone, brighter, darker, so it can really reduce the strain on your eyes as you're using it. Plus, with it being so small, and I have small hands, so imagine how small that is, and rel being relatively light, I think this would work much better on paperbacks than a lot of my other book lights. Then along with it, we had this leather bookmark that says bookmarks are for quitters, which looks very hard wearing and can't go wrong with that. And then this little gadget, which is, I think, to help you hold open the pages of a book. So you would put your thumb into the hole like so, and then that point would go into the crease of the book and you could hold it open one-handed. So I've never had one of these before, but I'm intrigued to try it, especially with stiffer UK hardbacks. I feel like with US hardbacks that isn't so much of an issue, but it could really be useful with UK paperbacks. And if I didn't say paperbacks through that whole sentence, I should have. Then I also got a variety of bookmarks, one from the Regency Marketplace December crate, which looks adorable, and then two from Amanda as part of my Christmas present. First there's this beautiful feather with a pendant with a butterfly and these little purple beads and a little flower. Purple is my favorite color, so that is lovely. And then these delightful bookmarks, which would be very good for travel with just a variety of flower patterns on them. Then for Christmas, my parents got me another variety of books as well. The first is Regency Slang Revealed by Louise Allen, which is nonfiction. It does exactly what it says and looks at slang that would have been used by the lower classes, the criminal underbelly of the Regency world, and gives you some definitions, some background as to what they all mean and how these work. Also in a Jane Austen theme, they bought me Jane and the Final Mystery by Stephanie Barron. I reviewed this back in July, which conveniently was Jane Austen July, as I was given a digital proof copy, but I'm really glad to have a physical copy as well because I have been reading this series since I was 14 or 15 years old, possibly younger, which is over half my life at this point, and I'm really sad to see it end, but I'm so pleased to now have the complete set of these novels. If you're unfamiliar, this is a series that features Jane Austen as a detective and takes from her real life in terms of where she was, who she was visiting, and everywhere that she goes, some sort of mystery happens. And being as observant and astute and discreet as she was, she makes a wonderful detective. Then they gave me The Clockwork Girl by Anna Mazzola, 
which I honestly don't remember that much about. I just remember thinking how beautiful the cover was, both in hardcover and in paperback. I believe this is set around the French Revolution. Okay, I stand corrected. Earlier than the French Revolution, 1750. But there is a clockmaker and his daughter, but children are disappearing from Paris streets, and there are dark secrets being hidden, and it sounds really wonderful. And it has a review from Ian Rankin on the back, which I wouldn't have expected for this sort of book, but now I'm really intrigued. And then they gave me a few more things that aren't exactly books that I'm going to read cover to cover, but are still bookish, and I think you all might be interested as well. The first are two sets of books from a series called Brain Games. We have Jane Austen word searches and more Jane Austen word searches and other puzzles, which are really delightful. I love the New York Times Brain Games. I love those sorts of things. So I'm really excited to get to these at some point. They also gave me this, which is Stitch Poldark, which is six cross stitch patterns for incredibly complex counted cross stitches of various scenes from the Poldark television show, which I just adore. It was beautifully shot and these cross stitches are beautifully designed and they give you everything you need. They tell you how large a fabric you're going to need, how big it's going to end up being. They break down the chart for you in small sections. I think this is the one I would honestly do. I love Demelza and these colors would go with the paint here in my bedroom really quite well. And then in the chart they also break down exactly what color thread you would need for each of these. I currently have two unfinished cross stitch projects as well as my ongoing crochet project. I don't know when I'm going to get to these, but I'm thrilled to have it for whenever I feel like challenging myself. And finally, given how stressed I've been, my mother thought perhaps I would enjoy the Outlander coloring book. I have to say these coloring books are so detailed that they often kind of stress me out a little bit, <laughs> but it was very thoughtful of her and I do love the Outlander series, though I haven't read the latest book yet, so no spoilers down in the comments. And then finally I went into New York twice during November and December and found a couple books. <laughs> First of all, I went to the opera with my friend Veronica in December, and we discovered that Shakespeare and Company has a branch in New York City that's three to five blocks north of Lincoln Center and the Met. So of course we had to go. And their bargain section, their sales section, was really good. So I picked up first Island Queen by Vanessa Riley. And this is the story of Dorothy Kerwin Thomas, who I believe was a real figure in the Caribbean. She was a free woman who built this real estate empire, I think, and became very well known, traveled a great deal, and yet we know nothing about her. I am really excited to read this. I did win a free copy of this on Goodreads, but it was a Kindle copy. And I discovered that, though having Kindle is a wonderful thing, because I'm not physically seeing what I have in there, I often forget to read what I have in there. So given that this was a bargain, I thought maybe having a physical copy on my shelves might remind me to read it more often. Then they also had The Golden Wolf by Linnea Hartsuiker which is the third in the Half Drowned King series, and the Half Drowned King is on my January TBR. So this is a Norse Viking sort of tale, and given that this was also such a bargain, I had to pick it up. I am now actively on the lookout for book two, although my library does have it digitally if I need it. 
And then lastly, they also had People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry for a steal. I have not read any Emily Henry yet, but I have heard such amazing things about her over the past year or so that it really convinced me. And again, this was a bargain, so I had to take it. This is, I believe, a friends to lovers trope, but honestly, I'm just diving in and seeing how it goes. Veronica also bought book lovers, so we're hoping to do a trade-off once we've each read our own Emily Henrys, and then we'll read each other's Emily Henrys. Then in November, I took myself to see Spamalot on Broadway and happened to wander into a few bookish places during the day before I went to the theater. First up, I picked up this copy of Yerma. Yerma is a play originally by Federico Garcia Lorca, and I do have the original Spanish version already. But this is a version of the adaptation by Simon Stone that the National Theatre did a few years ago with Billy Piper. I was lucky enough to see it back in, was that 2018, when it came to New York, and it was amazing, and I've been on the lookout for a copy ever since, so I can have both language versions. Then I also stepped into the New York Public Library to kill some time, and while I was there, I picked up this Macmillan Collector's Edition of The Adventures of Arsène Lupin, Gentleman Thief by Maurice Leblanc. I've been meaning to read these for ages. I started the show Lupin on Netflix last year, really liked it, I just haven't finished season one yet. So I hoped by having the original stories here might spur me on to actually keep going with it. And then finally, the last book, after I took myself to have all my final vaccines for the year done, I took myself to the Friends of the Library bookstore across the street afterwards as a treat to myself. And I found The Scottish Chiefs by Jane Porter. Now I read Sister Novelists by Devany Loser last year with Megan of Megan the Story Girl which was a biography of Jane and her sister, Anna, Anna Maria, who were both very famous novelists during the Georgian and Regency eras, but have kind of been forgotten about nowadays. So I was thrilled to discover one of Jane's novels for $2 in the bargain basement of the library. This is, I believe, her romantic reimagining of the story of either William Wallace or, or William the Bruce. Aha! It is the tale of both Sir William Wallace and Robert the Bruce, so I wasn't entirely wrong here. I grew up on songs about both of those Scottish heroes and having read a biography of Jane and her sister, I'm really intrigued to actually read some of her work. And believe it or not, I'm not quite done because I also picked up at a local indie bookstore four more classics that I need to tell you all about. They are still down in the basement, but I will have pictures of them over here. I first picked up a collection of three Wilkie Collins short stories or novellas, one of which is Miss or Mrs. And then there are two more as well whose titles I can't remember at the moment. And I felt like I had heard interesting things about them at the time. I have a love-hate relationship with Wilkie Collins, but I'm intrigued to see where these stories go. I also found a copy of The Semi-Attached Couple and the Semi-Detached House. I always mix up that title, which I have heard fantastic things about by so many Victober participants over the years. So I'm really intrigued to get to that one as well. It's compared to Jane Austen, so I'm here for it. I then also found a copy of The Trumpet Major by Thomas Hardy, which is one of the few Hardys that I haven't read yet. So I'm thrilled to have it. I think it takes place during the Regency, 
And I just discovered that one of the main characters is called Festus, which always makes me giggle. And then finally, I found a copy of the anonymous play Arden of Faversham, which just sounds wild. I feel like it's, it's an older play. I feel like it's kind of Elizabethan, Jacobean, somewhere in that general time period, and that it explores greed and sexuality and all of the dark side of human nature. And I just had to check it out. I had to bring it home with me. I can't remember if it's directly related to Shakespeare, but it definitely is in my head, so I am very intrigued. So thank you all for sitting with me through this incredibly long book haul. If you made it all the way to the end, even if you didn't make it all the way to the end, please leave me a comment with which of these books you are most excited to see me read this year, or if you have any compliments about any of the books that I picked up. Please don't tell me if you didn't love a book just yet. After I've read it, then go ahead and tell me and we can discuss our thoughts. Let me know if you picked up any amazing books that you think I might also be interested in. Let me know if you have questions if you want to give these books as gifts to someone you love. I am here for any and all bookish conversation, and until next time, be safe, be well, and happy reading. Bye everyone!